On today's show, we'll be talking about depression and the workplace. Hello, I'm Shannon Skinner, and this is Extraordinary Women TV. My guest today is Jan Wong. She is the author of Out of the Blue, a memoir of workplace depression, recovery, redemption, and yes, happiness. Really glad to have her here today. Now, before you meet her, later in the segment, before we take a break, I'll have my regular Good to Know Minute when I ask my guests for their top success tip, and you'll hear Jan's. Well, Jan Wong, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's so nice having you here. Now, you've written a number of books. You've been a journalist for uh, 30 years, um, even a writer for a long time. Um, now, your before you started your, your career in journalism, you did something that I thought was very interesting, and you went and you spent some time in China during the Cultural Revolution. Um, you were at McGill, and then decided that you were gonna go over there. Um, what was that experience like for you? It was being like, it was like being in Disneyland, except it was all communist. So <laughs> I was really interested in Maoism yeah. and in Chinese culture. I'm a third generation Canadian. So I grew up not speaking Chinese at home because my parents are Canadian born too. And so I wasn't very good in any of the sciences or maths. So at university I had to figure out what I was gonna do that I could eventually use to earn a living and I couldn't figure out anything. And then I thought, well, maybe I could specialize in Chinese studies and maybe become a journalist eventually. So I majored in Asian history and I couldn't speak Chinese. And I knew that for graduate school, I would have to read and write Chinese. So I went to China in 1972, and it was the middle of the Cultural Revolution. So I was completely, <laughs> it was completely strange. Right. But I loved it because I was very radical as a university student. So I was a Maoist, even though I really didn't understand what that meant. Right. Um, and so I ended up going as a, a student for my summer vacation, but I bugged them until they let me stay and study. And I became the first Canadian to study there during the Cultural Revolution. And I ended up at Beijing University. I mean, at that time, I mean, you loved it. What was it so much that you loved about it? Was it... Uh... Oh, well, they kept talking about creating a new person. Right. Um, about being um, where women would be equal and everybody would work for the good of the state and the good of society in general. And coming out of um, the 70s, it sounded like a great, a great thing to do. Um, I only saw problems because, of course, the Vietnam War was going on at that point. And um, if you were a thinking university student in those years, and if you were majoring in some kind of the arts, then typically you would be anti American imperialism. So because that's what I felt, I thought, well, China was the beacon of hope for the world. This is, you had to be there. Yeah, sure. You had to yeah. be there. And so that's why I wanted to go to China. And it was very actually trendy because Richard Nixon had just gone. Interesting. Um, the Cold War was still on. Yeah. But China suddenly became very fashionable. And the Mao suit became fashionable. And a few years later, you know, Bloomingdale's in New York was advertising all these Chinese sort of mouse suits in their window. So the whole idea of China, when I said Disneyland, I meant that it was almost like this fantasy world you would go into. And you know in Disneyland, I only went there recently, I, I resisted it for years, but everybody's acting out a role in Disneyland and they're not allowed to break out of their role. So that even the people, they don't have anyone actually picking up garbage. What they do is they have people dressed in nice clothes, who if they see any garbage on the ground will pick it up. But there's no like caretaker role because it's kind of demeaning. So they have all the happy people in Disneyland right. and they have all the um, characters, Mickey Mouse, Snow White. Well, China was very much like that. People did not break out of role. So when I was there, they would tell me how wonderful the society was, but it wasn't true. Well, it's interesting. And then so you chose to become a journalist. Um, yes, because of that experience yeah, interesting. in China yeah. with everyone telling me stuff that wasn't true. So I became very interested in propaganda and in trying to get at the truth behind a story. 
And so you've had quite a successful career as a journalist. Um, you've had More that, or less. <laughs> that, but you had the dream career that mm -hmm. so many journalists uh, wish for. You've written for the New York Times, um, right. a number of. Um, um, uh, well Wall Street known. Journal. Wall Street Journal. But my goal, of course, was to go back to Beijing, and I and that I achieved. So that was. It's true. I did have a dream career. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, um, in in your, I mean, did you know any journalists when you decided you want to be a journalist? Was there somebody that that you said, okay, they're telling the truth? I think that they're, um, you know, able to drill down and share a message. I want to do this too. No. I had no role models. Okay. Isn't that odd? There was it's interesting. There was no one who looked like me who was in the journalism business. And I think um you know, it was just I don't know where I got it from. Oh, I know. My role model was Lois Lane. <laughs> really? Cuz I love Superman comics. Yeah. I didn't identify with Superman. I identified with Lois Lane. Right. Even though she never seemed to actually do any real stories. But she was always running around with her notepad. Oh, she yeah. was always in the middle of the action. So I guess she was my role model. But I didn't have any real live role models in Canadian journalism because no one looked like me except Adrian Clarkson. But oh, she wow. didn't work as a journalist. She had a uh, a talk show. So that wasn't anything that I was interested in. I was interested in the front lines, running around trying to find out information. So Jan, what was it like for you working as a journalist here in Canada in the newsroom? I mean, what was that world like? Well, it was like, very uh, exciting and lots of fun. And what you find is if you do uh, a good job, then they'll just keep giving you more stories, and you keep, you know, doing the stuff that's really interesting. Yeah. So if you're good at both reporting and at writing, it's often very hard to get both um, talents in a reporter. But if you're good at both, then you can basically write your own ticket. So I could do all the stories that I wanted to do, and and sometimes I would come up with my own ideas. So it, that's the most gratifying is when you can um, set your own agenda. So I, I loved it. And you know, journalists are really known um, to be able to just crank out the writing, mm -hmm. um, almost like they're machines. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's yeah. the envy of, of writers. Yeah, we don't have writer's block. You cannot yeah. have writer's block if you work for a daily newspaper yeah. because you only have two hours to write it, or if you're lucky. Sometimes you have less. And you can't, nobody has writer's block who works at a newspaper. You can't. I mean, I don't, I never saw anyone with a writer's <laughs> block. It doesn't exist. You have to. You have to just sit down and write. And, well, there's the deadlines, and then there's the paycheck, and yeah. there's so much pressure yeah. to make sure that you you actually succeed in what you're doing. Right, and you don't want the opposition. You don't want your competition to beat you. Right. So it's yeah. not just that you're working in your own vacuum. You've got to make sure that they don't have the story. You have the story first. So it is a lot of stress. Now, you worked for the Globe and Mail for a number of years. Um, I read you quite a bit. Um, and, Thank you. Uh, uh, and you, what set you apart from many other um, journalists is that, I mean, you were really uh, the ultimate investigative journalist. And you had some really great assignments, um, very brave assignments um, yeah. um, at that, you know, while you were working there. Um, something had changed, uh, and you wrote a story uh, on uh, Dawson Creek and uh, the, the incident there, and that changed everything for you. Mm -hmm. Um, do you remember that moment when you thought, my life has just changed? It wasn't one single moment. Mm. Uh, so what happened is I covered a school shooting at Dawson College in Montreal, and I was urged by my editors to do analysis, to include analysis, which was very common, because newspapers were searching for a way to compete in this digital age. So we didn't just deliver the news, we also gave you opinion and analysis with it. And um, so my analysis included why were all three post-secondary school shootings in Montreal, and why were all three of the perpetrators um, minorities. Um, neither francophones nor anglophones, but ethnics. And so I wrote this story and there was a terrible backlash and um, my newspaper, the Globe and Mail, didn't stand behind me. Um, it's okay to run 13 letters to the editor. We got letters from the Prime Minister and the Premier and of course we're going to run those. We, we like that. 
What I didn't like was um, being uh, hung out to dry right. by an editor who, who sort of pushed me out the front door and said it's her fault. Yeah. And he wrote a column saying um, that the process had um, broken down in the newsroom. It hadn't broken down. He had edited it. He had read it. Everybody thought it was great, and they published it. So when you do that, you have to stand behind it. But they didn't. So there, that was one moment of feeling betrayed. And then another big moment was a death threat. I got a death threat. Yeah. When they, and then they didn't call the police. That was another big moment. Like, right. what is going on? Yeah. Because I, I had a death threat previously, and everything is taken care of. You don't, you don't have to call the cops yourself. And then there was the biggest blow was when I became clinically depressed, and they did not believe me. That was just like right over the edge for me. Yeah, so this whole, the, you know, the stress of the situation and, and whatnot um, did, did um, I guess, like so many people when they have loss or there's suddenly a, a change, mm -hmm. um, experience depression. But the difference between you and somebody else is that this was your work place. Yeah, it was my identity. It was your identity. But it's not, a lot of people go through this same thing. And so yeah. in my book, I write about my specific case, but I try to make it as universal as I can because workplace depression is extremely common. And when you lose your job, I got fired because I was ordered back to work and I was still depressed. And one... You needed to heal. Well, one aspect of my depression was my inability to write. So it was really a problem for me. If I went, if I physically walked into the newsroom, which I could do, I could walk, but I couldn't write. So I was afraid to go back. I also... It, my doctor said it would make me worse. So my problem was the um, questioning of my integrity. So when I lost my job, well, even when I was being questioned for my integrity, that was a devastating, uh, that was devastating for me because I only had my integrity as a reporter. Every time I did a story, basically you had to believe me when I told you I did this and I interviewed this person. And there's a lot of journalists who sort of fudge around or make it up. All we have is our integrity. And of course, um, you were known to be a tough journalist. Yeah. Tough was the word that was often right. used. Um, so I think part of it could have been ignorance mm -hmm. uh, on the part of the public and the employer and myself about who gets depressed. I had never been depressed before. Yeah. So when it hit me, I didn't understand what was happening. And what I learned is that strength of personality has nothing to do with whether or not you succumb to depression. You don't have to be weak. It's not at all related to that. It's brain chemicals. Just like a strong person can get the flu or AIDS, um, a strong person can get depression too. It has nothing to do with if you're weak or strong. And of course, this um, sparked you to write the book that we're here to talk about today, Out of the Blue. Um, and But before we do, we're going to take a, a break. And that means it's my good to know minute. And Jan, I know you've got a great success tip. So jump right in there. So my success tip is be brave. And it's, it's something that you can't just be. You have to try every day to be brave. It's, it's a goal that you, you aim for. And I tell my students, I teach journalism now in Fredericton at St. Thomas University. And I tell them that bravery is a muscle and you have to exercise it every day. And I mean in every aspect of your life. So for instance, if you see someone getting bullied, there's no such thing as an innocent bystander. You must be brave, you must speak up, you must intervene. And that's what I mean by being brave. If your employer is stomping on you and crushing you, but you're right, you have to be brave and you have to speak up and say, I will not do that. I will not um, bow my head and succumb to you because you're wrong. So that's what I mean by being brave. And I think it's a good mantra for your whole life. And it's a good mantra for young people to remember that it's not that whether or not you are brave, but you have to try to be brave. And the more braver you are, the braver you will be. Well, that's good to know, and thank you for that, so be brave. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, more with Jan Wong, an author. So stay where you are. Welcome back to the show. I'm Shannon Skinner, and I'm speaking with author Jan Wong. Um, so before the break, we, we, we sort of left it off that um, 
your experience with uh, depression, um, working for the Globe and Mail, um, sparked you to write the book mm -hmm. um, out of the blue. Um, let's talk about, I mean, what is this book about at its core? This book is about um, going through clinical depression mm -hmm. and coming out the other side. So it's about de the descent and the recovery and how uh, to cope with it, what it means, and why it actually is beneficial to go through something like a clinical depression because it changes you and I think it changes you for the better. It makes you more sensitive, more aware, and more appreciative. And in my case, you know, good things happened as a result of what I went through. You know, you talk about uh, the gift that you got uh, of the relationship with your sister right. that had deteriorated. Right. So before I became clinically depressed, my sister hadn't been speaking to me for several years. I think about two years, I'm not sure. And it was following the death of our mother. She went into, something happened. And I think she, I don't, I don't really understand it, but she wasn't speaking to me. But when I became sick um, with depression, she just came and helped me and stayed with me the whole time. And when I say help me, I don't mean making me cups of tea. I mean, she was there by my side for every bit of the fight. When I, This is not a just about clinical depression. It's about workplace depression and dealing with your employer. And in my case, I also had a union because newspapers older newspapers are unionized because we're very old industry. So I was also trying to battle my union that just wanted me to take a package and go away. And the reason I couldn't and I wouldn't is because it came with a gag order. And right. that was what my big battle was, freedom of speech. And for me as a journalist, I had to have my freedom. So it, it's all intertwined in the book. And the book uh, was a real struggle. I had a real struggle to write it because I wasn't able to write for a long time when I was depressed. But I, people didn't want me to write this book. They tried to stop me by imposing gag orders and I wouldn't do that. So my sister, who is very tough actually, she was there and standing by my side and attended many of the mediations and arbitrations. I had to go through two, two years of this legal stuff. Um, and it was really hard. It's really hard, but I've, I'm finding from my readers now, I'm getting emails from lots of people who have gone through the same thing. And most people don't hang in there. And that's why I think it's very important to be brave and, and to know when you are right and to stick to your guns. And, and otherwise, you'll, you'll be broken. If, if I agreed to that, I would have been broken. As a, as a reporter, as a writer, as a person. What do you hope um, to achieve with, with the book? Well, I want to start a, a dialogue, a conversation about mental illness. Yeah. I want people to, um, to know that they are not alone. I want to start to end the stigma. There's a lot of stigma about mental illness, which I had internalized myself. So things, weird things, and I talk about this in the book, like I go to my family doctor and I'm crying all the time. This is at the beginning when I don't know what's wrong with me. And her receptionist asked me, well, what do you want to see her for? And I'm just so embarrassed. I don't want anyone in the reception room to hear me. So I don't understand why. So in the book, I, I talk about stigma. I look at the history right. of our, our attitude to mental illness. And I trace it right back to ancient Greece and then medieval times. It's very interesting. And also the also the interesting thing I think about your book is that you do your best to go back to the time that you were experiencing those emotions, like being in yeah. the, um, the doctor's office and what it looked like. And um, it, it led you to, to believe as you came through healing, on the other side of healing, that everything sort of seemed warped at the yes. time when you were depressed. So yes. that for you was an eye opener. Well, because as a journalist, I'm always writing about things and observing things. Yeah. And what was very interesting about being depressed was that your view of reality is skewed. You see a distorted reality. People will say things to you. Now, you're not, I'm not making up the quotes, but my interpretation of what they said to me is different than a healthy person. So I might think that they were being really mean to me when they said something. But in fact, it was probably just a neutral statement. 
Like there's a scene in there where I, I'm meeting a journalist at a cocktail party and she says to me, I think they wanted to get rid of you from the get-go. Now, she's absolutely right, but it stung me. Right. And I felt like crying and I felt like that was an attack on me. Because everything's intensified. Yeah, well, you just, everything is skewed. Yeah. So I couldn't even remember the color of the sofa in my psychiatrist's office. I got the color all wrong. And so what it told me is that when depressed people don't see reality in the same way, and I think it's very important to talk about that, because it is a mental illness. Right. And yeah. then when you recover, um, like if she said that to me today, I probably would have gone, yeah, you're absolutely right. The, the journalist saying they wanted to get rid of you from the get-go. And I don't think it would have felt like crying or anything. I would have gone, you're, you're right. You feel stronger. Well, I'm healthy. Right. So there's a difference between depression, which is a mental illness, right. and being healthy. So by writing this book, I want to make people feel it's okay. It's okay to talk about it. It's the last taboo, right? We right. used to not talk about cancer. Right. We didn't talk about AIDS. Right. You know, this is the last taboo to talk about being clinically depressed. So Jan, in writing this book, um, as a writer, as a journalist, and, and you know, you are so used to analyzing and uh, dissecting, um, what did you learn the most from this experience? I learned that it's completely treatable. Clinical right. depression can be treated. So go to your doctor, and if your doctor re can recommend you to a psychiatrist even better, and um, that talk therapy works, you have to find a psychiatrist or a doctor who you feel you, you trust. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't trust them, it's not going to work. Talk therapy works, and so do antidepressants. They don't, I mean, for me, I had a messy experience. I had to go through four before I found one that seemed right. to do the job. But it works. It's not addictive. It's not permanent, unless you have lifelong depression, but that's not what this book is about. This book yeah. is about an episode. S situational. Yeah, right. situational. So yeah. it's entirely treatable. So don't suffer. Uh, and also that suicidal thoughts are common. So please understand that if yeah. you feel like killing yourself, this is part of the territory, but you can be treated and you can come out the other side and um, you'll be fine. And you, I also want people to know that you will come out a stronger person and a, probably a nicer person. Because I was very harsh as a journalist and I think I'm a little more understanding now. So it's changed you. Yeah, I yeah. think for the better. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Now, um, of course you uh, published the book uh, on your own because yes. there was yet another um, a little surprise where the <laughs> publisher pulled out. Yeah. So you published your book independently. Right. I mean, what was that experience? No one else would publish it. I'm an established author. Yeah. No one else would publish it. A well-recognized journalist. Well, my publisher at the 11th hour, the book was done. We had edited it for several years and it was on the way to copy edit, which as you know, is, is the last stage. I have nothing more to do. And that's when they said, we don't really want this globe stuff in here. And I said, I don't, it's about workplace depression. It's only a little bit about the globe. They're the, just the narrative thread. Right? You kind of have to mention the Yeah, I, I can't do workplace depression <laughs> without the workplace. Yeah. So I, my agent tried others. And what I found remarkably was that no one wanted to publish it. And what I also found in the writing of it is there's no other book that I could find on workplace depression as a memoir. There are books by experts. So I thought, I have to get this book out. I really, if I have to self-publish it, I will, and I did. <laughs> so where can people actually get a copy? Everywhere, because I happen to be extremely lucky. So I have distribution, so Indigo, right. uh, Loblaws, Shoppers, every independent bookstore has it. Your public library will have it across oh, Canada. Great. It's available, uh, at Amazon will have it. I sell it on my website. Free What's your shipping. U URL? <laughs> it's janwong.ca. Right. Okay. And I will autograph it for you. And um, it's available as an ebook. Like, it's saturation. I've managed to pull it off, which is not easy, but I've done it. And I have to thank the media. The media were really great. Um, and they gave me all the publicity a regular author would get. And so I've been on the bestseller list, which is unbelievable for a self published book. Yeah, I have one last question for you. 
um, given everything that you've been through, uh, and you've had quite an extraordinary life, is there anything you would change? No. No, I don't regret anything. And I would not want, I loved working at the Globe and Mail. It's a wonderful newspaper. I love that kind of journalism. But I would never compromise anything just to work there. I have to stick true to my principles and my belief. And in this case, it was, if I'm sick, I'm sick. And I have a right to be sick. And you are supposed to believe me because you believe me for 20 years. Everything I wrote. If you don't believe me now, then let's go down that road and I'll see you at the end. So I have no regrets. Well, Jan Wong, I have really enjoyed this time with you, um, finding out more about your life, um, your extraordinary life and, and your book. And I wish you all the best with your book. And uh, um, would love to catch up with you at some point in, in the future and, and see, you know, how the sales went and whatnot. <laughs> yeah. So maybe we can do a catch up some point. Okay. It's great being here. Well, thanks again. Well, for more information about uh, Jan Wong, you can find out uh, more about her on her episode page at my website, ExtraordinaryWomenTV.com. You'll see this interview, her bio, and there'll be more information there for you. Well, coming up in the second half of the show, we'll be talking about a dinner travel club. So stay with us. <laughs>